Do college students get less sleep? To answer this question, we're going to use SPSS to calculate a sample mean, do a single sample t-test, as well as a confidence interval. We're going to try to answer the following questions. First, approximately how much sleep do college students get? Second, do college students sleep less than the general population? And third, what's a ballpark range for how much sleep college students get? That's 95% likely to contain the true population mean. Let's focus on that first question. To answer that, we'll use a sample mean as a point estimate for the population mean. That is, based on our sample of 40 randomly selected college students, we'll go ahead and estimate how much sleep the typical college student needs. We'll keep in mind that if we were to sample repeatedly, each of our sample means would be a little bit different. So we know going into this that there's going to be some error that will be involved. OK, with that in mind, We'll go ahead, for this scenario, and use SPSS. We'll go ahead and click on Analyze, and then from the drop-down menu, select Compare Means, and then One Sample T-Test. When a dialog box comes up, we go ahead and we take our sleep variable and move it over to the test variables. For the test value, we're going to put in what we're going to compare college students to. In this case, we're going to compare them to the United States adult population, and recent research shows that they're getting seven hours of sleep each night on average. Here's our SPS output. In looking at it, we'll focus on the sample mean of 6.36. So we know now, in terms of our estimate, that on average college students get about 6.36 hours of sleep each night. There may be some error. In fact, there certainly is some error involved, but that's our best estimate based upon our sample. Okay, second, do college students sleep less than the general population? Well, we're going to focus specifically on can we reject our null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is that college students are just like everybody else, needing seven hours or perhaps even more of sleep. We're looking at a distribution here for the amount of sleep required by the adult population in the US. It's centered on seven hours. And looking at the left tail, because we're going to do this as a one tail hypothesis test, we can see our 0.05 shaded region. This will be our reject zone. So that if any sample mean falls in this reject zone, it will go ahead and be rejected. Coming back to our distribution of our adult population, let's assume for a moment that the null hypothesis is true. If that's the case, then 0.95 of our sample mean should fall in the non-reject zone, or the retain the null hypothesis area. So we have a decision. Will we reject the null hypothesis or retain the null hypothesis? If the null hypothesis is true, we know that just due to error, we'll reject the null 0.05 of the time but 0.95 of the time will make the correct decision. So again, if the null hypothesis is true, retaining the null hypothesis would be a correct decision. Rejecting the null hypothesis would be a type 1 error. On the other hand, it could be the case that college students really do need less sleep than the typical US adult. And in that case, if we were to reject the null, that would be a correct decision. And if we retain the null, that would be a type 2 error. OK, that was a brief review of the decision matrix. Let's come back to our SPS output. Remembering that we get to reject the null hypothesis if our p-value is 0.05 or less. Here's kind of like the big picture. You have the null hypothesis, and you have some data. If they conflict, then they both can't be true. And we can't throw out the data, assuming we think it's good data. So we reject the null hypothesis instead when that p-value is 0.05 or less. Looking at our SPS output, we have our t-value of negative 2.452, our degrees of freedom of 32, and our significance 0.02. Let's focus first on the t-value. Keeping in mind, how did SPSS calculate that t-value? Remember, our formula for a single sample t-test is sample mean minus the population mean divided by the standard error. We can get this information from our SPS output. Our sample mean is 6.36. Our population mean, assuming the null hypothesis is true, that college students are just like everyone else, would be 7. And our standard error is 0.26.
And when we calculate that, we get a t-value of negative 2.46, pretty close to what SPSS gave us. Any difference is likely to be due to rounding error on our part. What does that t-value of negative 2.45 actually mean? It means that our sample mean is approximately 2.45 standard errors below the mean. That is, we would have to go one, two, and a half approximately standard errors below the mean before we get to our sample mean. And that's pretty far away uh, if this null hypothesis is true. Uh, this would be a very unlikely sample mean. So again, that sample mean is 2.45 standard errors below the mean. Okay, the next thing in our uh, SPS output is the degrees of freedom, which is 32. And that's simply calculated as our sample size minus one. And then finally, we have our significance for two-tail tests. Now remember, we were interested in a one-tail test. We just wanted to show that college students sleep less than the general population. But SPSS doesn't ask us if we're doing a one-tail or two-tail. It always gives us a two-tail. Given that it gave us a two-tail of 0.02, if think about it as two tails, we take that 0.02 and we know that has to mean 0.01 is below the mean and 0.01 is above the mean. So if we added them together, we get our two-tail value of 0.02. If we're doing a one-tail test, then it's just half the amount of our two-tail test. So for a one-tail test, our p-value is 0.01. So keep this in mind. Anytime you're doing a one-tail test and you get the SPSS output for a two-tail test, you can easily make the correction. Just take the value, divide it by two, and that will give you the p-value for a one-tail test. Okay, remember we get to reject the null hypothesis if p is less than or equal to 0.05. In this case, we'll be able to reject the null hypothesis since our p-value is less than or equal to 0.05. And we'll conclude that college students sleep less than the average population. On to our third question. What's a ballpark range for how much sleep college students get? That's 95% likely to contain the true population mean. Specifically, we're going to determine a 95% confidence interval. Here you can see some examples of what a confidence interval might look like. We have our sample mean in the middle, and then we have a range around it where we're 95% confident it contains the true population mean. Keep in mind, though, that not all confidence intervals will contain the true population mean. If you're doing a 95% confidence interval, that means about 5% of your confidence intervals will not contain the population mean. Here's an example of 100 confidence intervals uh, generated by a program uh, where for each one it took a sample mean and that will let you know whether uh, the confidence interval is more to the left or to the right based upon that sample mean. And also notice that there are different widths and that would de depend upon the sample standard deviation. So here are some confidence intervals and then generate another 100 and another 100. And the ones in red are where the confidence interval does not contain the true population mean at the 95% uh, level. So you can see that sometimes uh, you might get a few more than five out of every 100. Okay. So to review, a confidence interval is a range that's likely to contain the population mean. And now let's look at how to determine a 95% confidence interval for how much sleep college students get each night. Let's return back to our SPS output, and we'll focus on the 95% confidence interval of the difference. To create our confidence interval, we'll begin with our test value of seven. That is, that's our comparison point of the adult population getting seven hours. But what about for college students? Well, we take that seven, and we add to it our lower bound value of negative 1.1655 comes out to be 5.83. So that's our lower bound uh, of our confidence interval. Then for upper bound, we take again that 7 and we add to it our upper bound of negative 0.1079 that SPS gave us. And that comes out to be 6.89. So we have a confidence interval for how much sleep college students require. That's 95% likely to contain the true population mean. It goes from 5.83 to 6.89. Now we could also have done this by hand, and I just want to take a moment to show you that, just so you understand where is SPSS getting this, these values. So our formula is sample mean plus or minus t critical times the standard error. t critical is the only perhaps new thing uh, to you, so uh, let's just go through this step by step. 
Our sample mean we get from the SPS output at 6.36. Our standard error we also get from the SPS output, it's 0.26. And for the t-critical, well, for that we can go to a t-table. If our confidence interval is 95%, that leaves 5% left over. So for a confidence interval of 95%, at the t-table we look up 0.05 in our, as a column. Now, our degrees of freedom, as you may recall, from the SPS output was 32. So in our t-table, we look up the row 32, degrees of freedom, and where our column and row intersect, 2.0369, that is our t-critical value. Okay, so let's plug that then into our uh, confidence interval formula. So we have confidence interval for 95% is equal to our sample mean, 6.36, plus or minus the t-critical, 2.03, times the standard error, 0.26. And we'll simplify there, so we get that the confidence interval of 95% is equal to 6.36, plus or minus 0.53, and that gives us our confidence interval range of 5.83 to 6.89, which matches what SPSS gave us. All right, now let's say you wanted a different confidence interval. With the t-table, if you wanted a confidence interval of 99%, you would use an alpha of 0.01. If you want a confidence interval of 90%, you use an alpha of 0.1. Everything else would be the same. With SPSS, what you'll do is first you'll again select the single sample t-test. Then when the dialog box comes up uh, for the one sample t-test, you click on options. And for the confidence interval percentage, you put in the percentage you're interested in, for example, 99%. Okay, so to recap, for a 95% confidence interval, there's a 95% probability that the confidence interval contains a population mean, keeping in mind that approximately 5 out of every 100 of them will not. Let's say we want a more, um, a shorter uh, confidence interval. Well, the confidence interval will become smaller if we're willing to be wrong more often. For example, up above, we see a confidence interval for 99%. If we instead want a confidence interval for 95%, well, the confidence interval is now shorter. It's less likely to contain the true population mean. If we had a confidence interval of 50%, well, our confidence interval will become even smaller, and it would be even less likely to contain the true population mean. Okay, what would be uh, another way to get a, a smaller confidence interval uh, that would imply greater accuracy? Well, if we increase our sample size, that will also result in a decrease in our confidence interval. So if we increase our sample size, for example, from 10 to 20, that would make a smaller confidence interval. And over here are another 100 confidence intervals that I ran, this time increasing that sample size. So in this case, there's still 95% confident interval, but we're now working with a smaller range, which can be helpful. So a larger sample size gives us more information, allowing us to have a smaller uh, confidence interval size. Okay, we've looked at how SPSS uh, can help answer our questions regarding do college students get less sleep. Based on our sample, approximately how much sleep do college students get? And we said college students get approximately 6.36 hours of sleep. Do college students sleep less than the general population? And we concluded that they sleep less than the population, p less than or equal to 0.05. And finally, what's a ballpark range for how much sleep college students get that's 95% likely to contain the true population mean? And we concluded that college students get little sleep for that 95% confidence interval ranging from 5.83 to 6.89. I hope you found this tutorial helpful and my appreciation to those who provide materials on the web that helped me in creating this presentation. Thank you.